getting ready to, uh, I was in Florida, getting ready to, uh, to speak at a youth camp, and about 800, maybe 1,000 students, and I was backstage, kind of getting my heart ready, and the worship was going on, and, and um, finally I just kind of, that's how that second book was birthed, I'm going to share a little bit of both, and um, God began, I began to kind of get anxious, and I said, God, if you would, I, I'd rather not do my story, you'll understand why, I'd rather preach, so me and God began to argue about it, like I was going to win, and so we're arguing, you know, not out loud, because that would really be weird, but we were arguing, and uh, somebody came back and said, the, sand, the band's on their last song, and I said, well, they're going to have to make some songs up or start over, because I ain't ready to come out, and so they began to sing some other songs. And I knew when they got to Kumbaya, we were in trouble. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But uh, anyway, they continued to sing. And finally, uh, God kind of spoke to me. And here's what he said to me. The greatest weapon in our life as a Christian is our testimony. Right. And you got to listen because it got my attention and it stirred my second book, Toilet Bowl Christianity, because sharing my story is like throwing up. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather do anything than throw up. You ever been laying in bed like at 3 in the morning, and all of a sudden your stomach says, we need to throw up, and you're thinking, I don't want to get up, so you begin to think happy thoughts. You turn on Joel Osteen to feel better about yourself. <laughs> That's funny. I don't care what you are. So anyway, my stomach said, if you don't get up, you're going to throw up. So I got up. And I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just me that has weird thoughts, but my face is in the commode. And I just have some random thoughts about my face in the commode. And one of my first thoughts is, is who was here before me? I hope they were throwing up. See, I think we ought to have two commodes, one that you throw up in and one you do your business in. And so I'm throwing up stuff I ate in the first grade. You ever been that sick? Elmer's glue will come back up one day, and so I'm throwing stuff up. But here's the deal. What I found out, when you physically throw up, you feel better. Here's why. Because you get the waste out of your body, that poison, and you've got to, and you feel better. It's the same thing with sharing your story, and no matter what story you have, now, I'm going to tell you this because I'm going to recognize a different group of people tonight because my story, if I was choosing stories, I wouldn't have chosen mine. See, the deal is, sharing my story, I've got to rehash and relive and go back to places that I, I don't want to go. But Revelations 12, 11 says that we overcome the enemy by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. So every time you share your story, you're defeating the devil. And so I want you to know I'm still arguing with God, and, but it, it's almost like spiritually. Now, you need to understand that, um, that the longer I've shared it, the easier it's become. The first few years was just tough. In fact, I didn't even share some things. But the more I grew in my faith, the more I wanted to share my story. Now, let me just say this. How many of you in this room, you were saved at the age of 10 or younger? Now, wait before you raise your hand. But you were saved at 10 years or younger. You grew up in a Christian home, never got into smoking, drinking, partying. Pretty much you lived a pretty cool life. I'm not saying you weren't perfect, but you just you stumbled, but you kept getting back up. How many of you here in this auditorium, that's your testimony? You never really did anything wrong got saved when you were a little kid, and you've lived for Jesus since. Raise your hand. Anybody, raise your hand. Let me make sure you understand my question. How many in this room, you were saved at the age of 10 or younger, and you grew up in a Christian home, godly parents, never really, never really wavered, you kind of stayed straight, you never got into smoking, drinking, partying, and that's your testimony, would you raise your hand? Would you stand? Am I not talking loud enough? Okay, I'm just, if that's your testimony, stand. 
I want everybody to look around. There ain't very many. Stay up. And here's the deal. Make sure you understand, if you were saved at 10 or younger, this is what these people are saying, to stay up. You were saved at 10 or younger, never wavered, never got into smoking, never got into partying. You've just lived a pretty clean life. Even if you messed up, you didn't stay there long. That's your testimony. Anybody else? I want you to look around. Because when I started, all right, we got one more. Now, here's the deal. Let me just say this. When I started doing this over 35 years ago, and I would ask that question, it was more than three-fourths the crowd. I want everybody to look around. Now, you that are standing, I want to ask a question. How many of you standing, when you hear a story like mine, the, the abuse and the stepfathers and, and all the garbage, how many of you that are standing, when you hear a story like mine, there's been a time in your life when you've said to yourself, you know what, I don't have much of a story. Raise your hand. Anybody that's standing? Almost all the time, it's everybody. Are you ready for this? People, I mean, I've, I've gotten standing ovations. I've stood in front of 50,000 in Buffalo, New York, and people stood just like they did for these little girls. What a birthday party that was. I mean, they could have really been messing up, and they're getting a dance for church. That's a pretty incredible birthday party. And then the older girls were about to die watching them because they did it pretty to the T. I have a feeling they did it a few times that night. But here's the deal. You need to understand that you that are standing, the greatest testimony in this room is not mine, it's yours. You that are standing. Because here's why. Some of us had to go to hell to find heaven. You guys didn't have to go. You still had to be saved, but you didn't have to go through the hell. And if I was choosing a testimony, you that are standing, I would have chosen yours. Amen? Amen. Quietly be seated and give them a round of applause. Now, if you have a Bible, open up to Psalm 17. We're going to look at several passages I, as I get into my story. My first book, I was trying to put it together, and I, I, I was about the third or fourth chapter, and I didn't have a title. And you just can't write book, read it by Ken Freeman, it's good. you got to have a title. Psalm 17. So my pastor was preaching on salvation, and here's what salvation means. Everybody say redeemed. redeemed. Say delivered. delivered. Set, free. Set free. And everybody say rescued. Here's the truest definition of being saved. You're being rescued from something for something. That's salvation. And all through the Scripture, the word rescued is there. Now, you, your Bible might say delivered or set free, but when I pause, I want you to say rescue with an E or rescued with an E-D. So everybody say rescued. rescued. Say past. Rescued. Say purpose. So when I was trying to put my book together, my pastor was preaching on salvation. And I love the cross. I love things about the cross. And here's the deal. God wants to rescue from your past for his purpose. So everybody say rescue. Past. Purpose. Now I'm going to go ahead and forewarn some of you tonight that have never heard my whole story. I am going to open up some Pandora boxes tonight. I'm going to open up maybe some worms in your life. And you, when you leave here, you're going to have to make a phone call. You may have to write a letter. You'll understand why I'm saying that. So everybody say rescue. rescue. So here it is. Go to Psalm 17. Would you look at verse 8? Now we're going to look at several passages. Don't know how many times the word rescued is used, but it's used a lot. Psalm 17 Verse 8, when you get there, say, I'm there. If you're listening, say, I am. And then I'll get into my story. It says, guard me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Protect me from wicked people who attack me. From murderous enemies who surround me. I would have given anything on Friday if I could have given an invitation to that high school. If I could have paid him money 
for me to give them Jesus, I'd have done it. But see, what's the sad part is, many of those students that heard me, I, I would have given anything for them to be here. And if you're a member of this church, raise your hand. Put them down. Would you look around? This is not a normal Sunday night crowd. It should be. Because you're usually meeting over there. And you can't even fill that up. Everybody say shame. So here's what I'm telling you. If you can do this tonight, you can do it the next week, the next week, and the next week. I don't know what it is why we think we can come on Sunday morning and then don't come back till Sunday morning. Listen, we need each other. And as much as you can meet together, it's going to help you. Everybody say rescue. Past, purpose. Look at what he says in verse 9. Protect me from wicked people who attack me, from murderous enemies who surround me. They are without pity. Listen to their boasting. They track me down, they surround me, and throw me to the ground. I had nine stepfathers growing up. By the time I was in the eighth grade, I was already in jail. My role model, I didn't have role models like these little girls did here. My role models were alcoholics, drug addicts, womanizers, and just and jailbirds. I took my first drink of alcohol when I was nine. My parents thought it was cute and funny. By the time I was in the eighth grade, was in jail, my sister, she'd gotten picked up a couple weeks before. They couldn't keep us long, but they scared us. I went to 24 different schools growing up, went to five different high schools my last year of school. If you're listening, say I am. Everybody say rescued, past, purpose. I want you to understand that nine stepfathers that I know of, my mom was an alcoholic. My relatives, aunts, uncle, cousins, haven't seen since I was two. The oldest of seven siblings, and what I couldn't say at the school, I have a half-brother that died from needles at 40. The sad part of his life was he, was he died lost. He wasn't a Christian. I have two half-sisters, one I briefly met years ago. Both are alcoholics along with their kids. I have another half-brother I found four years ago in his 40s. Just got out of drug rehab for the fourth or fifth time. And if he doesn't make better choices, he's a dead man. None of them are saved. I have another half-brother who I actually, him and I actually talk, we email, we text. He's in his late 40s. He went to prison four or five times. Found out that him and my other half-brother were sexually abused, more so than me and my sister. And I couldn't even imagine it. I want you to understand that anything, you name it, he did it, but he, he got saved years ago. He's happily married, two beautiful kids. He just finished writing his first book. And my baby sister, when I found her 20 years ago, she was about 40, maybe a little bit less. My sister had hepatitis C from needles and cirrhosis of the liver from alcohol, became the very person she hated. She became my mom. Now watch this. Let me read it again. Verse 10. These people are without pity. Listen to their boasting. They track me down. They surround me and throw me to the ground. They're like hungry lions eager to tear me apart. Like young lions in hiding waiting for their chance. Now get ready to speak. Arise, O Lord. Stand against them. Bring them to their knees. And what does he say? Rescue me. Say it strong. Rescue me. I was in Miami, Florida when 911 went down. I have a greater respect for firemen, policemen, those people that work. I have a greater respect for our country and our flag. You need to understand, I was in Miami, Florida, and I'm not being ugly, but everybody looks like a terrorist in Miami. And then there was me. I was at a Christian school doing a four-day deal. On that night, we planned on meeting anyway, but that night, over 1,300 people showed up. And that night, are you ready? Over 300 people gave their life to Christ the night of 911. Now, 
so I remember where I was. Everybody say rescue. rescue. Past, Past. Purpose. purpose. My mom would drag me and my sister out of her beds at night, would beat us with a broomstick, a belt, and a switch. Now, you need to understand, going to 24 different schools, I was always a new kid. I didn't have what these little girls had here tonight. I didn't have any sleepovers. We didn't have, we didn't have any friends because we were always new, always running from the law, an ex-husband, a boyfriend, or a bill collector. My mom was an alcoholic. My mom woke up drinking, went to bed drinking. We slept, we've lived in bars, streets, cars, and alleys. My mom, would again, would beat us like dogs. We would sleep in our school clothes. And that way, when my mom came in at 2 or 3 in the morning, me and my baby sister, I'd wake her up. We would slip out the back door and hide in the backyard, a garage, a street, an alley, a park. We knew after a couple of hours, my mom would pass out or change clothes and leave. We could eventually slip in and get a good night's rest. If you're listening, say I am. You see, and here's the sad part of my story. There were churches all around us. Are you ready? But where in the world was the church? Nobody knocked on our door. They they would watch my mom beat us in the front yard. Nobody reached out to our family. So I want you to understand that my concept of God and church wasn't very good. Because I'm thinking maybe the reason they're not coming and knocking on our door is we're the ones they don't want in the church. Everybody say rescue. Past, purpose. Go to Psalms 18. Go quickly. Psalms 18, verse 16. I want to get to the good part of my story. Look at Psalms 18, 16. If you're there, say I'm there. If you're listening, say I am. When I pause, you'll know when to speak. He reached down from heaven and he, everybody say, rescued me. So when I pause, we're looking for the word rescued. So even if yours doesn't say it, he drew me up out of the deep waters. Look at verse 17. And he, yeah, mine said delivered, but the word is rescued. From something, you think about it, 911, those rescue workers went in to those buildings to do what they were they, to do what they were paid to do, what they were trained to do. Little did they know those buildings would collapse. Are you ready? They, weren't, they were built not to collapse, but they did. Remember the Titanic? They said it wouldn't sink. It sank. When you put your faith in what man does, you're going to sink and it's going to fall. But when you put your faith and trust in Jesus and His Word, yes, sir. you're going to be all right. Yes, sir. Everybody say rescue. rescue. Past. Past. Purpose. Purpose. Look at this. He delivered me or He rescued me from my powerful enemies, from those who hated me and were too strong for me. Everybody say rescued. Rescue. Past. Past. Purpose. Purpose. Go to Psalm 69. I'm just giving you a couple. Psalm 69, we'll go there in a minute. It'll be verse 1. But look this way. My mom would wake up drinking, woke, went to bed drinking. She worked in bars and clubs. My baby sister and I would go bar, bar hopping with my mom. She eventually would, we would fall asleep in a booth. When I was these little girls age, we would fall asleep in the booth. My mom would forget us leave us there and go to another bar, another bar, and we would wake up the next morning in a bar by ourselves, locked up. I was seven, my sister was five, and I know what I'm about to say is going to be tough. Are you ready, church? This is why you ought to be meeting on Sunday nights and filling this place up. This is why on Wednesday nights, listen, any chance you can get together, you need to get together. Your young people need to be a part of this youth ministry. Your children need to be a part of what this children, these children are doing. If you're listening, say, I am. Yes. Say, rescued. rescued. Past. Yes. Say, purpose. Yes. I was seven. My sister was five. 
My mom would leave us two or three days, two or three weeks at a time. Drop us off a box of chicken, a bag of hamburger, and fries. That would be our meal two or three days, two or three weeks. At our house, you came to party and pass out. It's amazing, those little kids cry, and then when you pick them up, they stop. Because you know what they're, you know what they're doing? Man, if I cry long enough, they're going to get me out of here. Now look at me. Now you've got to listen close. I'm making everybody cry. And I know you've got to work hard to listen. I know you do. And so you've got to really listen tonight. The bottom line is this. Every day, God wants to rescue us, not just from our past, but for His purpose. If you're listening, say, I am. My mom woke me up one night. This chapter, one of my first books, it's actually in both of my books, woke up one night. Seven years old, I'm in the bunk bed above. We're living in California. My baby sister was five. She was in the bunk bed below. My mom woke me up. She said, I'll see you in three days. I'm going to go party. She left us with the next boyfriend. About 30 minutes later, and it could have been longer, could have been shorter, but I know that I went back to sleep. I wake up to hear my baby sister crying. Now, if she cried, I cried. I didn't like crying. So I would come, I would try to jump out of the bed, calm her down, we'd go back to sleep. I mean, when I was watching these little girls, I was about to lose it. I mean, it was incredible. Because you're looking at a guy that I, ne- I didn't cry in front of people. Uh, I-, I thought that was a sign of weakness. And I didn't want anybody to know how bad I was hurting. When I looked in the bunk bed, it wasn't a dream or a nightmare. When I looked in the bunk bed... My mom's ex-boyfriend was raping my five-year-old sister. That night, he grabbed me by the arm, and he slung me to the bottom of the bed. And that night, he molested me as a seven-year-old. I wish I could say that's the only time that happened, but it wasn't. For my baby sister, it was a whole lot more than what I want to know. Now, listen close. The world that we live in, church, every six minutes, a murder. Every eight minutes, a rape. Every 16 minutes, a suicide. And children today in the age of five will be beaten to death by somebody they love. My mom came home three days later when she walked in through the front door. Rather than run from her, we ran to her. I remember wrapping our arms around my mom's legs. We were looking up at her. When I looked up, the dude was standing there at the bottle of beer but when I looked up, my mom was a good-sized lady. She could handle the dude. But when I looked up, she was wasted. So I knew she wouldn't listen. So she kicked us off of her legs. She went back, passed her in the bed. Dude got in the car and left. A couple of days later, I go into my mom's room. I sit at the end of her bed. I'm waiting for her to wake up. She had a whiskey bottle on her nightstand with a shot glass. My mom would start her day with a shot glass of whiskey. That's just how she started. So I waited. She drank the whiskey, and when she finished, I began to tell her my story, what happened. Next thing I know, we're in the car, headed to the hospital. She's called the police. They arrested the ex-boyfriend, took him to jail. They came and got me from the hospital after they checked me out. They took me down to the jail, if you can imagine, seven years old. They lifted me up so I could look in the jail cell window and say, that's the guy that did those things. If you're listening, say, I am. Psalm 69, verse 1. Everybody say, rescue me. I know it says, save me, but rescue me, O God. Look at this. For the flood waters are up to my neck. Deeper and deeper I sink into the mud. I can't find a foothold to stand on. I'm in deep water. The floods overwhelm me. I'm exhausted from crying for help. My throat is parched and dry. My eyes are swollen with weeping, waiting for God to help me. Those who hate me without cause are more numerous than the hairs on my head. Those enemies who seek to destroy me are doing so without cause. They attack me with lies, demanding that I give back what I never took. Look at me. We left California. We're now in St. Louis. I'm 10 years old. My sister's eight. We're living in Hazelwood, Missouri, a suburb of St. Louis, and I wake up. My mom's whiskey breath is in my face. Her body's over my body. 
She's drugged my sister into the bedroom, and I'm thinking, this is a weird dream. But when I opened my eyes, it wasn't a dream. My mom's body was over my body. I'll never forget it. Her whiskey breath was in my face, and she had a knife in my throat, 10 years old. Now, my mom had threatened it a lot of times, but this time I thought we were dead. My sister was kind of hitting at her. Psalm 69, look at verse 14. Pull me out of the mud. Don't let me sink any deeper. Rescue me from those who hate me. Even though I didn't know God was anywhere, God was there. I promise you, as I look back in my story, I can tell you over and over, I should be dead. I should be in jail. I should be a wife beater, a child abuser, a drug dealer. I should have been a lot of things. But God had a plan and a purpose for my life. That's true. That night, my mom's telling me and my sister, we came from hell, we cost her too much money, we'd be better off dead, nobody really wanted us, I believe that, she's going to kill us. I begged, I cried as much as I could for 10 years of age. My mom eventually drops the knife on the ground, passes out on my chest, and if you call it living, we got to live another day. Everybody say rescued. rescued. Past. Past. Everybody say purpose. purpose. Turn to Psalms 91. Go quickly. Psalms 91. I want to get to the guts of my story. I'm setting it up. Psalms 91 is one of my favorite psalms. Look if you would. Psalms 91 verse 3. If you, get, if you want to do something this week, read Psalms 91. Read it all week long. Pray over it. Pray through it. Incredible. Psalms 91, verse 3. For he will, for he will, he'll rescue you from every trap, protect you from every fatal plague. He will shield you with his wings, shelter you with his feathers. Look at this. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Don't be afraid of the terrors of the night, nor fear the dangers of the day, nor dread the plagues that stalk in darkness, nor the disaster that strikes at midday. Verse 9, if you make the Lord your refuge, verse 9, if you make the Most High your shelter, listen, no evil will conquer you. Look at verse 14. The Lord says, I will, I will, I will, those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name, verse 15. When they call on me, I'll answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue them and give them a wonderful life. Now that night, my mom dropped the knife on the ground, and we got to live another day. Two years later, I'm in the sixth grade. My mom was passed out on the kitchen floor, kind of like this gym. When I walked in, I wanted to make sure she was out. I rolled her over. And when I realized my mom was out, the butcher knife she held to my throat at 10, and I'm now 12. I grabbed, I took it, and I ran that blade up and down her body. I ran that blade across her throat. Here's what I'm thinking. If I can stab my mom, if I can kill my mom, if I can cut her throat, my problems would be over. If you're listening, say I am. Now, I can't tell you why. Even if you were were, were to ask me why, I can't tell you. That night, I never cut her. I didn't stab her. As much as I hated her, I dropped the knife on the ground, ran out through the front door screaming. That was my life. Now look at me. I know some of you have got to work hard to listen. You see, here's the deal. God wants to rescue us every day in our life. From our past, from our failures, for his future and his presence. If you're listening, say I am. So I want you to understand this. That was my life. I eventually moved. I was born in Portsmouth, Virginia. I got to Texas as quickly as I could. In 1968, I moved to to Corpus Christi with my stepdad, my two half-brothers. And um, he didn't tell me this, but when we got there, he was remarried. Her name's Peggy. She had a couple of kids, and I was real small growing up. When When I got married at 20, 
I'm 6'1". I weighed 125 pounds. So if you can imagine, when I was a senior and younger, I weighed less than 100 pounds. So I got beat up all the time. So I went to my stepdad. I, I move in with him. His wife begins to beat me up like my mom. They drank. They partied. And finally, one night, I had enough. I packed my suitcase. I'm not advocating this, but it worked for me. Everything I own, and I won't forget because me and my half-brother talked about it. They were probably about uh, eight, maybe ten and eight. And both of them were crying. They were begging me to stay, but I knew I had to leave. So I eventually packed my suitcase, walked out the door. It was only for a couple of nights. I found a church. I thought it would be safe. They had these stairs, and back underneath the stairs, I could kind of hide, and that's where I kind of slept. I still went to school. Finally, these dudes that I drank with, not the Christian. The lost people were better to me than Christian. Because these Christians, I didn't dress like them, didn't look like them. And, that, and that's why, guys, we've got to start reaching out to some Ken Freeman. I'd have given anything to be adopted. Uh, bottom line is, I started living with these, <laughs> this one family two or three days. Another family, two or three weeks. Another family took me in. I don't know what it was. They were Christians, kind of like the Blind Side movie. They took me, and they let me sleep on their couch for about four months. And during that time, I ran into a football player. Everybody say Jeff. Now, I'm going to tell you, I hated Jeff. Jeff had a gutless dad, but he had a godly mom. And Jeff loved Jesus. The dude would witness to anything, anybody, anywhere. And I became his stinking mission field. Everybody say rescued. rescued. Past. Past. Purpose. Purpose. So Jeff decided I needed, to Je I needed Jesus. Everywhere I turned around, he was there. God loves you. So I'd cuss him out. God loves you more. I'd cuss him out more. God loves you most. I ran out of cuss words. <laughs> he would follow me into the bathroom. I want to tell you about Jesus. We'd go to the library. Tell you about Jesus. We'd go to the cafeteria. And I tried to avoid him, but he would always find me. He said, dude, can I sit here? I said, you can sit here, but I want to hear about Jesus. He said, all right. He said, can I pray for my food? Go for it. I should have known. This was his prayer. God, thank you for my food, and Ken Freeman needs Jesus. <laughs> Are you ready? If it hadn't have been for Jeff, I'd have never found Jesus. We need some Jeffs in our school. This dude loved God. Then he started inviting me to church. Now, I'd robbed a couple of churches, broke into a couple of churches, but he wanted me to go. So one Saturday night, I got drunk with some of my friends in this school parking lot. We fell asleep in the car, woke up the next morning with a hangover right across the street from three churches. So I watched these people go to church. It's hilarious. You don't do the drunk part. But one of these days, get to church early. Watch people go to church. Some of your best fights are on Sunday morning. I, I watched as these guys pulled in parking lot, and this dad literally yanked his kids out. Get out of the car, both of you. His wife got out. We're late. I'm watching this. And I'm not lying. I heard this one man tell his kids, you're both going to go in there and sit down and shut up and praise God or I will kill you. Everybody say rescue. So I went to Jeff and I said, dude, this church thing is bad. They ain't happy. In fact, I waited one time. They came out madder than when they went in. So I told Jeff, I said, dude, we ought to go get drunk. We don't, you know, we don't yell at each other. We pass out and throw up. It's cool. He didn't think it was funny. I said, give me two good reasons why we ought to go to church. And he did. 
girls and food. I was into chicks and chicken. Because I was hungry and something else. Okay, that was the first. Because I promise you, there's a blonde going, what was he? If you're listening, say I am. So I go to church to check out the girls and give me some food. Second Baptist Church, Corpus Christi, Texas. In fact, back on the, my table, on the front cover of my CD and DVD, I'm standing in front of the church that's no longer there, but I, I got a picture of it right in front of it where I was saved. So I walked in the back of the church. It, wasn't, it was full, like the, it was packed. And I walked in, and I'm thinking, you know what? And I saw the girls, it was good. So then I started looking for the food, like the food was going to be in the auditorium. So I went to Jeff and said, dude, where's the food? He said, it ain't in here. In fact, we're not eating till after the service. Now I'm mad. Are you ready? So I'm walking from the back of the church, and I'm thinking, I'm going to sit on the back row. But I found out a lot about some churches. If you want to get a good back seat, you need to get there four or five days early in some churches. I love it because you guys are sitting here. If you're listening, say, I am. So here's the deal. So I'm walking in the back. The back seat's already full. So we're walking down the aisle, and we're passing up a few good seats. And I'm thinking we're going to sit on the stinking front row. But it was already full of fanatics. You know what a fanatic is, don't you? person that won't change their mind and will not change the subject. That's a fanatic. They were into Jesus. Are you ready? I'd never been to church like this in my life. My first time to go to church. I'm following Jeff. Never been to church in my life. My first time to go to church, I joined the youth choir. the stage and I walk up and I'm freaking out I said what are we doing he said you're in the choir I could cuss wallpaper off a wall I'm in the choir y'all are laughing and I walk up and I won't forget these big old football players started hugging me love you brother and I'm thinking first of all I don't know who you are, and I, and I don't know your mama. So you can let me go, brother. Another guy hugs me. I tap him on the back to let him know. Pat him three times, and this is what I'm saying. I'm not gay. I'm just telling you. I was lost. Then the girls started hugging me. Hallelujah. I'm thinking, when do we speak in tongues? Now, here's the deal. <laughs> what? What? No, no. See, y'all aren't think. See, I heard there were tongue-speaking churches. I'm thinking, I'm in. <laughs> if you're listening, say I am. Guys, look at me. I didn't understand the words. I'm in church. I'm in the choir. Then the music guy gets up, decked out in his suit, walks up behind the pulpit, and opens up the second Bible of a Baptist church, the hymnal. He opened that, and I looked at the lady playing the organ. She came over on the Mayflower. The lady playing the, the piano dated Columbus. And I'm not being ugly, but why do we let them play the instruments until they die? I'm freaking out. Oldie Goldie night, I guess. 
I shared that in a church in Tennessee. I won't forget it. This guy came up to me after the service. He was just laughing. He said, remember you said about the lady, you know, at the organ being old? I said, oh, yeah, dying. I said, I'm just kidding. He said, you're not going to believe this, dude. Three years ago, I had an 81-year-old aunt. She was playing the organ one Sunday morning, and she died. I said, why are we laughing? I am not lying. Here's what he said. She needed to go. She couldn't play the organ. If you're listening, say I am. So I, I'm not being a, I was at first, I was at, uh, in, um, oh, I, I got to think, oh, it wasn't Norfolk. I was in another town, I'll think about it, oh, Roanoke. I was in First Baptist Roanoke, Virginia, and I'll never forget, the church was packed, probably 1,500 people, and the invitation came, and I'm a, I don't know how I didn't laugh, but if we were getting ready to do the invitation, the lady headed to the organ. I am not lying. Are you ready? She pulled out her walker. Oh, it gets better. I'm the only one watching. I'm about to die. How many of y'all ever saw the Carol Burnett show? Anybody? Do you remember Tim Conway, the old man? I am not lying. She headed to the organ in that walker like this. And I'm thinking to myself, they're all going to go to hell before you get to that organ. Everybody say rescue. Past purpose. So now I'm in the choir. And there are four verses to most hymns, but we only sing the first, the second, and the last. I asked Jeff, why did they write a third one? <laughs> now, if you're listening, say I am. So now I'm watching it, and it's freaking me out. We're singing all these stupid songs about a stupid God. These people think I'm a brother from another mother. <laughs> one of the songs, it was copyrighted, I am not lying. It said 1492. That lady that dated Columbus must have liked that song. <laughs> and then finally... He stopped, and the preacher got up. His name is Freddie Gage. Anybody ever heard of Freddie Gage? Meanest preacher. You'll have, about that tall, grew up in the streets of Houston, Texas. First time I ever heard a preacher, and he gets up. Have you seen these guys? I mean, he gets up. It was like the 4th of July. Have you seen these preachers that when they talk, they look mad? Have you seen them? God loves you. I'm thinking to myself, what would your face look like if he hated me? <laughs> You're listening, Sam? Yeah. And this dude got up, and he, I mean, he just went off. And here's how he started his message. By the way, I'm going to be with his son tomorrow night. Are you ready for this? He got up, and this is how he started. All my friends are dead. So I leaned over to Jeff. I said, now I know why he's mad. <laughs> Jeff said, no, 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 no. Well, you need to understand, this dude grew up in the streets of Houston, Texas. A lot of his friends were in gangs. And a lot of his friends are dead because of drugs, alcohol, and violence. Now I'm digging on him. Now the more he preached, the madder I got. I mean, he would walk over here like you guys left. You're not even here. And he would do this. And I know, he, I know he said a lot, but all I heard him say was this. You're going to hell. <laughs> then he would walk over here like you left. You're going to hell. And I'm thinking they heard you over there. <laughs> this is what blew my mind. As soon as he said we were going to go to hell, it's a Baptist church, they said, amen. Because Baptists, amen, anything. 
I promise you somebody said amen. If you take the word hallelujah and glory out of a Pentecostal church, they'd never talk. So as soon as he said amen, we're going to go to hell, I leaned over to Jeff and I said, dude, what does amen mean? Because I didn't know what it meant. I knew it was a prayer thing. He said it means so be it or we agree. So we just voted to go to hell. I said, are we going to eat before we go? Is there a bus waiting to take us? This is happening in the choir. So now we're all going to hell. Then he started pointing. I mean, he just, and I was glad I was in the choir. And he used words. Pastors, we've got to use words they understand. Some of you have been justified. They were happy about that word. Woo! Some of you have been sanctified. Woo! I was petrified. Are you ready? And then it happened. Come on, don't stop listening. We got too many kids walking around back there at the back. You you guys, if you would, find a seat. Now, if you're listening back there, that's good. But here's the deal. So now I'm in the choir, and he quits pointing out here. He decides to point to the choir. Guess who he points to? Me. That finger's right at me. I'm thinking I'm going to kill Jeff. Because I'm thinking Jeff told him to point at me. He pointed right at me and said this. Now, by the way, nobody did anything. Nobody did nothing except me. He said, some of you, right at me, have been convicted. I don't know why, but I raised my hand. (laughs) Oh, now you're laughing. I'm going to tell you why I raised my hand. Because I'd been to jail a couple times. I leaned over to Jeff. I said, this guy's good. He's good. (laughs) If you're listening, say I am. And then he said, we're going to have an invitation. So we bowed our head. So I'm bowing my head, but I'm kind of peeking. Because I'm thinking they're going to come get me out of the choir. (laughs) Are you ready? October of 1968, on a Wednesday night, Corpus Christi, Texas, on Furman Street at Second Baptist Church. I remember it well. I knelt, I knelt my head, and the preacher said, are you tired of running? And I ran from everything. As soon as he said that, I started crying. Now, I didn't, I didn't cry in front of people. I got snot going everywhere. I look over, and Jeff, the football player, he's crying. Everybody's crying. I'm thinking, this dude is good. He makes you mad. You want to be glad. Now you're sad. Felt like you've been had. Are you really listening? Say, I am. And he said this, if you're tired of running, stand up. And I stood up in the choir. Now, I was the only one in the choir standing, but over 100 people stood up out in the congregation. And they're weeping. And the football player Jeff began to pray. I heard him. God, save Ken Freeman. And you got to listen to me because I didn't know what that was. But I knew it was good. Now, I'm in the choir. I'm the only one standing. Like, I'm getting ready to do my first solo. And I didn't think Highway to Hell would be a good song. Are you ready for this? He said, if you're tired of running, come forward. So I, they kind of, the choir kind of split, and they let me walk out. I walked down to the front. I'm now standing in front of that preacher. I'm not lying to you. And by the way, Freddie Gage, I've met him. He's heard my story. Freddie Gage is now in a, in a home. Uh, he's not doing well at all. I call him from time to time. Because, see, it wasn't his preaching, because he, he just ticked me off. But God used him. So I, I'm, I'm standing in front of this dude now. I got snot going everywhere. And he put his finger in my face. I'll never forget it. He said, son, 
Do you know you're a sinner? No, I'm Billy Graham. <laughs> Are you ready? Here's what I told him. I said, sir, I don't know what I am, but I know this. Nobody wants me. I ain't got a family. I'm living on a couch with these people. I don't even know who they are. I said, you see that guy in the choir? This was funny. He said, oh, yeah, that's Jeff. It was a conspiracy. <laughs> are you ready? I said, whatever that dude's got, I want it. That night I knelt down. Now, we're not close to being done. I want you to know that. If anybody's in a hurry, it ought to be me. Because I'm not going to bed anyway. Watch this. I, I knelt down with him, and he, he, said, he said, I'm going to take you to the Roman road. And I'm thinking, I'm not getting in a car and going with you anywhere. <laughs> and then he opened up the Bible to the book of Romans. I'm feeling better. Romans 3.23, he said this, for all have sinned. But he put my name, Ken Preem, in his sin. I said, dude, I'm there. Then he went to Romans 5.8, and Romans 5.8 says, Even while yet Ken Freeman was sinning, God demonstrated his love by sending his son to die for me. He said, dude, he loves you. He went to Romans 6.23, The wages of sin is, but the free gift of God is eternal life. He said, dude, you're going to die, but God's gift is salvation. Then he went to Romans 10.9 and 10. Romans 10.9 and 10 says that if you can believe in your, confess with your, that he's Lord, he said, I'll save you. In fact, verse 13 says, whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, guys, look at me because I'm almost done because I've I got to give you the rest. That night I did get saved. Now, and I wept, harder, maybe harder than I've ever cried, but I wept. And there was a release in my life. I can't explain because I knew nothing about the Bible. I was there because of, of a football player by the name of Jeff. That night I got saved. We were driving home that night. It was Wednesday night, and we were driving home, and I pulled out a cigarette because I was going to smoke. And Jeff said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going to smoke. He said, Christians don't smoke. I said, why don't we smoke? Are we going to go to hell? He said, no, but when you get to heaven, you'll smell like you've been to hell. So I threw the cigarettes out the window, and then he said this, Christians don't litter. <laughs> we drove back and got the cigarettes so we could throw them away. I said, well, I bet you Christians don't drink. He said, not this one. I said, well, then what do we do? Now, you're going to laugh. I found out we went to church a lot. Are you ready? We're driving home Wednesday night. I said, what are we going to do Thursday? He said, we're going back to church. I said, you got church on Thursday. He said, we do. So we go to church Thursday. He buys me a Bible. Friday, we're driving home Thursday. What are we going to do Friday? We're going back to church. You got church on Friday. We do. We're driving home Friday. He said, what are we doing Saturday? You got church on Saturday? We do. I said, I'm just going to guess about Sunday. <laughs> I said, I'm assuming we're going to church. You pick me up about 1030? Oh, no, no. I'm going to pick you up about 9. You got church at 9? Oh, no, no. We have Sunday school. I said, Jeff, I don't even like Monday school. <laughs> I thought I joined the only church that met seven days a week. What it was, they were doing what I'm doing here. In fact, I'm getting ready to go to a church. We're going to go from a Sunday through a Sunday because they, they just want to see a lot happen. But here's the deal. That week changed my life. The school found out, this is the rest of my story, the school found out I had no legal guardian. I had to go back and live with my mom. Didn't know where my stepdad was, but I went back. I flew to St. Louis to live with my mom. Now, you know, you got to watch. This is where my second book comes in. Malcolm and Johnny Granger, they wrote the foreword to my second book. I call them my Jesus parents. And here's what happened. God called them from the church in Corpus to a church in San Antonio, Texas. The pastor, his name was Jack Taylor, great man of God. 
I went back to St. Louis. Well, this couple and their two boys began to pray for me. They moved to San Antonio, and they sent me a one-way plane ticket to fly me from St. Louis to San Antonio. They said, if you'll come live with us, we're going to love you. We're going to help you. And so I packed my suitcase. Took it. I hated my mom. I got a bus, took it to the airport, got on the plane, flew to San Antonio, Texas. I walked off the plane. I want this one. You could meet them at the gate. They met me at the gate. I didn't even really know them that well. They put their arms around me, told me they loved me. They were going to help me. They got me a paper route. I had to have a job. I lived in a camper in their carport. I thought it was a condo. Are you ready? I graduated from high school. I have two years of college. Now, you need to listen. Please listen. Because I wish, this, listen, I, I, will, I wish we could have done three or four services because there's a lot of Ken Freemans that need to be here. And we need more Jeff. I came in one night. I just met my wife. We weren't engaged yet. But I came in one night, and I said to Malcolm, I said, dude, why is it when I see families? Why is it when I see moms and dads and sons? Why do I, when I see this, why is it I want to get a beer, smoke a cigarette? I said, Malcolm, I went and got me a beer tonight. I said, I smoked a cigarette. I said, for me, I know it's wrong. And I said, why do I want to go there? I know I'm saved. And this is what Malcolm said to me. He said, do you love your mom and dad? Just out of the blue. We never talked about it. And I said, Malcolm, if my parents were to walk through your front door and I had a pistol, I would put it to their heads and I'd blow their brains out. I said, I'm, other than myself, I've never hated anybody more. And Malcolm said this to me. Colossians 3.14 says that we're to forgive others because he forgave us. And here's what Malcolm said. Until you're willing to forgive your parents and love them like he loves you, you'll never be free. And I collapsed on the floor. February 7th, 1970, I'd been saved almost a little over two years. Are you ready? That night, I said, God, would you first forgive me for hating myself? And then I said, God, if you would, would you give me a love for my mom and dad? And you need to understand, I hadn't seen my dad in 16 years. I hadn't talked to him. I went over to the phone. I called my mom. My mom answered the phone. She was drunk. I said, Mom, I, I need you to, I got her to pour, get, make her some black coffee. Eventually, my uh, mom sat down. I began to talk to her, told her that I was a Christian. She didn't, she didn't know I was saved. And I said, Mom, I'm a Christian, and I want you to know that I've hated you for a long time. Would you forgive me? My mom said yes. Now, for 14 years after that day, I loved my mom, began to witness to my mom. When I would go see her, I would sit in, she worked in bars, I would go to the bar. I'd drink my diet drinks, eat my pretzels, and in between her customers, I would begin to tell her my story. My mom never got saved. I, here's what I couldn't say at the school. I watched my mom lay in a bed. I watched her eyes lose blood. I watched her skin turn yellow. I watched her body bloat. The last six weeks of her life, cirrhosis of the liver. I want you to listen. The men that went to bed with her, the people that partied with her, they said they were her friends. Not a one of them came to see her die. My mom, to my knowledge, is in hell tonight. I called my dad. The operator wouldn't put me through. The operator told me, he was in California, she said, if I, I can put you through, but if I do, I could get in trouble. Now, don't do this, but it worked for me. I told her my story. She's crying. I'm still crying. And finally, I said, man, if you don't put me through to my dad, I said, God might hurt you. <laughs> the phone rang, and she probably joined every church she ever walked by. Are you ready? My dad answered the phone. How many of you, your mom or dad is here tonight in the service? Raise your hand. Your parents are here. Put them down. From this point on, 
at any point you want to go sit with them, you want to go stand with them, you've got my permission to do that. Because see, there's one thing that I'll never know. I'll never know the love of my mom and dad. My dad answered the phone, by the way. He said, who's this? I, I didn't recognize him. I said, this is Ken Freeman. He said, what do you want? My name's Jim. And I said, sir, you're my dad. I'm your firstborn. I said, you don't, have to, you don't have to be my dad. You don't have to give me any money. I said, but you know when you have to do what I'm about to ask you to do? But I'm a born-again Christian. I've hated you for a long time. Forgive me. And he hung up on me. But I was free. Did it hurt? Yes. But I was free. Are you ready? Three weeks later, I got a letter. The letter said, Ken, I'm not your dad. You're not my son. He said, I have the four pictures that he sent me to this day. These are the only four pictures I've, I have left of you. Stay out of my life. That was in 1970. I got married in 72. Just celebrated 40 years of marriage. I have two boys, 35, 39, and eight grandkids. Now, my mom said I'd never make it. My mom lied. Are you ready? In 1998, my first book, Rescued by the Cross, was about done. I flew to San Francisco with my oldest son and my wife. My youngest son was on a mission trip. We flew there. I cried the whole way there. Landed in San Francisco, and on, on June, on no, I take it back, July the 11th, Saturday morning, we drove from San Francisco to San Leandro. I walked in through the front door. There stood Maxine. I have a relationship with her today. When I met her, she was married to my dad for 47 years. I walked in, and there stood my dad. Now, you need to understand, because even the young lady that, I, that came tonight and heard me years ago, when I shared my story, I, I never met my dad, didn't know if I wanted to ever see him. And I walked up to my dad for the first time. Here's what I said. 28 years ago, you hung up on me. 42 years, are you ready? Last time I saw my dad, I was four. The next time, I was 46. 42 years ago, you walked out on me. And I think my dad wanted me to slug him or shove him, but I put my arms around him, and I whispered in his ear. I said, dude, I said, I've already forgiven you. God loves you. And we sat down, and for 10 hours, I told him my entire story. He couldn't even look at me. He just wept. We left. Maxine walked us out. He couldn't even get up. She walked us out to our rent car, and I remember Maxine telling me this. She said, I've been married to your dad 47 years. I've known him 10 years before that. Watch. She said, I've never seen your dad cry one time in his life. I called back that night. He was still crying. For the next six years, I sent him my first book. I sent him a, a, a DVD or whatever I had. Maybe it was a VHS, but I sent him a tape. I sent him, um, my, I sent him sermons that I had on cassettes. I sent him scriptures. I, I began to send him Father's Day cards. I never got anything back, but I was free. 2004, Maxine calls me. She said, your dad, 78 years old, has throat cancer, bone cancer. He has five months to live. This is in my new book. I flew with my wife two weeks later. And look at me. If I could have videoed any, I don't even know if I owned a video camera, but if I could have videoed this, what I'm about to tell you, I wish I would have. We flew to San Francisco on May 31st, 2004. And on June 1st, we drove back to his house sat down at the kitchen table. I had a mission. I looked at Maxine. I said, Maxine, if you died, would you go to heaven? She looked at me and said, ever since I've met you and your wife, I know I'm saved. But I looked at my dad. I said, Dad, you got five months to live, maybe. If you died, would you go to heaven? Now I'm going to use a strong word. My dad looked at me and said, I've been a bastard all my life. Now, you need to understand what that word means. It's the same word they call Jesus in John chapter 8. Same word. Illegitimate. I said, Dad, maybe you forgot, but I was conceived out of wedlock. 
So I want you to understand something, Dad, that Jesus loves you just like you are. We went back. He said, I deserve hell. I said, we all deserve hell. Went back and he laid on the bed. I'm giving you the short version. I grabbed my dad by the hand, began to witness to him a little more. And on June 1st, 2004, I led my 78-year-old dad to the Lord. This is the part I wish I would have videoed. He, he, my hand's good size and his is too. He wouldn't let go of my hand, and he was crying. He pulled me close, and my dad said this. He said, I've never been more at peace in my life than right now. I really believe God saved me. And then he said this. He said, I bet you you would have been a great son. And then he said this. I'm sorry. I prayed with my dad. I had to fly out the next day. Twelve days later, not five months, I was walking up on a stage to preach at a youth camp, and my phone vibrated. I took it out, went outside. It was Maxine. Twelve days later, Maxine said, I need to tell you, this morning your dad died in his sleep. Now, I believe he's in heaven. Now, my baby sister, she called me up years ago. She was going to kill herself and kill her son. I begged her. I said, give me 24 hours. I called a preacher friend of mine, and my baby sister was saved. I sent her a Bible. I found her a little church to minister to her. It's probably been six years now, maybe seven. My baby sister had a bad day. That night, she took some pain pills. She drank a glass of vodka just to go to sleep. My sister died in her sleep about six years ago. That's my family. But here's the bottom line, and I'm done. I've been rescued by the cross. I was a kid that nobody wanted. I didn't get to get adopted. I didn't get a, I was, do you understand that the one family took me in five months, the other family that took me in, I was almost 19 years old. And if that family had not taken me in, if that football player had not witnessed it to me, I wouldn't be where I am today. Church, you ought to be ashamed if you got to go back to that building next week. You ought to meet right here. You ought to be bringing people that need Jesus. Guys, we're running out of time, and we're running out of days. Question, if your heart were to stop, if you were to die, have you been rescued by the cross?